Welcome everyone. Um, oh, it's working. Cool. My name is Rasmus Kelms, and I'll be presenting uh, a bulletproof approach to theming. Um, can you hear me, everyone? Cool. Um, uh, as I said, my name is Rasmus. I'm a front-end developer. Um, I work at the, the wonderful company of Pites in Copenhagen. Um, we're a Drupal company, and we do design, development, and content strategy, and 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 all sort of Drupal related stuff. Um, <coughs> um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, and some of our biggest clients, uh, well, we work mainly with uh, large media sites, Scandinavian media sites and organizations. So, well, that was me. Enough about me. How do we define ourselves as themers? Um, how many here defines themselves as themers? Show of hands. And how many here are developers? Wow! <laughs> I did not expect that. Okay, cool. So, are there any designers present? Cool. And do any of you consider yourself as both a developer, designer, and a themer? Quite a few, actually. That's quite good. So, um, my goals for this talk is to uh, give you a set of tools and a workflow that can help help decrease the amount of time you need to get a functional theme up and running. Um, <coughs> and there's not going to be <laughs> any silver bullets. I'm not going to presenting this magical function, sadly. <laughs> I've looked everywhere in the API, and it's nowhere to be found. And I guess if I someday found it, it would just be a basic implementation of die. But uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> so, um, but we we have no such magical function. But what what we do have is uh, is a set of uh, a set of tools, and we have a proper foundation. And it's if we make sure to have have uh, have uh, if we prepare well and and make sure that we have the right foundation we are going to be setting, setting ourselves up for for success and and we'll be able to reach our goal faster um <coughs> does anybody know this particular case or scenario um bad timing and the indifferent backend developer with little to no interest in presentation or markup um i know i've met this developer not at my present company of course yeah. All my colleagues are nice guys, and <laughs> they understand me. <laughs> um, but sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll come across this situation. You'll be thrown into a project at a, a particular unfortunate moment, and there's little you can do about that. That's, that's not something you can influence. Um, but what you can influence is, is stuff like clean code, foundation, and, and design. And you know, this, this situation would be, or this scenario would be okay too, if uh, if you had the chance to to do at least regular code reviews in cooperation with the backend developer, because you know more often than not, this backend developer he has interest in presentation and markup. He cares about the final site uh, and the final product he he he's supposed to deliver. We all do. Um, we're all building the same product and the same site. And if any part of the site suffers or lacks, it reflects badly on on the entire team. And so of course he. He's interested in this, but he doesn't have the time, nor should he be focusing on these uh, these, these certain uh, issues. Um, but you know, the fact of the matter is, we have uh, modules like views, and we have modules like panels. All these modules are presentational modules to at least some extent, and and therefore it requires at least uh, sometimes uh, that they are being configured by a backend developer. And if this backend developer doesn't have the time to to dive in the presentation or markup, the views are probably going to be configured uh, wrongly, and you'll have to, as a themer, when you enter the project, you will have to go in uh, and redo a lot of these configurations. So, <coughs> sorry. Um, so, how do we deal with these scenarios? Um, first, let me say these scenarios they will never be ideal. Um, for these scenarios to be ideal, a themer should be involved from the beginning. Um, and mainly because themers has the know-how the designer and the front end and the back-end developer requires. Um, and I know the previous session, uh, Web Systems, they touched about this a lot as well. Um, and it's all about identifying the standard elements and what Drupal requires uh, from the beginning. Um, <coughs> 
the basic ask, uh, question you should let your themer ask, and you should let him ask uh, the backend developer, is does the output match the intended design? Um, this simple question, it helps clear a lot of misunderstanding. And in the end, <laughs> it, it doesn't require a lot. It's, it it require maybe regular meetings, one meeting per week <laughs> or every other or every other day. It doesn't require a lot, but it's a simple question and it can help clear a lot of these misunderstandings. And as such, you help avoid these constant views, configurations and, and changes to these. Um, and in the end, we all know this. How many here uses the module features? Well, <laughs> uh, and we all know that if uh, if we export a view to these features, it is, it's nice and we, we help uh, ensure uh, some, some matter of consistency uh, among uh, the development platforms and, and uh, and to the side we deploy to. But if you have to change, uh, let's say, just a basic field in a view, have to remove a label, you'll have to, uh, you'll have to recommit this uh, feature file again, and you'll have to commit it, and you'll have to revert the components on, on, on the site itself. Um, and that takes a lot of time. Easy, you'll have 10 minutes go by by this. And, and it's, not, uh, it's not the best of si situations. But what, what we need to do, and also what we can focus on as themers, um, it's communication, and particularly the communication from us to our team members. Uh, it's both uh, the communication to uh, the backend developer, or the developer you're supposed to be receiving code from, and the designer. You have uh, a unique knowledge of how Drupal works, what Drupal requires from, uh, as, 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 you know, as out of the box. Um, and it's, it's your job to share this information. So how do we improve communication? Um, well, <laughs> um, a lot can go wrong when we start these projects. Um, often we work on large sites. Drupal is a, it's a multi-site platform, and as such, the sites can grow very large. And also the themes can grow very large, and there can be a, a huge amount of modules. And that also requires a, a huge amount of communication between team members. <coughs> and as such, every time you have to communicate with a team member, there is a slight chance that something might go wrong during this exchange. And if we focus on these exchanges, we might have a chance to, to improve the overall communication. Um, so basically, focus, how, focus on how you can make a difference from your point of view. Um, it's easy to pitch and moan about uh, the situation we're in, but ultimately it's our own responsibility to make sure that we com communicate the requirements we work with. Also, if you're a project manager, are there any project managers out there? My boss is. <laughs> uh, okay, and a few others. Um, and that's great. Ensure, that's a really simple rule. Ensure consistent communication and regular meetings with output and code reviews between your backend developer and, and your uh, and your themer. So. <coughs> so, but um, as a lot of you are designers, um, how many here knows about style guides? Knows what a style guide is? Cool, a lot of you do. Um, um, a style guide, well, if you ask Wikipedia, uh, a style guide is basically, a style guide or style manual is a set of standards for the writing and design of documents. The implementation of a style guide provides uniformity in style and formatting of a document. Simple and straightforward. So basically, a style guide is a document describing a set of visual standards. <coughs> a style guide could be description of logo usage. It could be color schemes and how to use colors. Um, it could be typography, it could be grids, and so on. And previously, um, style guides that has mainly been used for brand guidelines. Um, it has uh, been used to ensure the proper use of a company's logo across different platforms and on different kind of media. Um, but there is also a valid use for it uh, in Drupal and, as, and for us as themers. And one of the best style guides I've come across during my little research um, around the internet is the Skype brand style guide. Um, it's it's a great style guide. It's uh, it shows uh, very well how to use their illustrations and and their logo and and generally how to communicate uh, in all of their their material. 
And sadly, I don't have the link. I forgot to add it, but uh, uh, I'll make sure to add the link to, uh, on the slides when uh, I upload them after the, the session. Um, so, one clear benefit of StyleGuys is that it ensures consistent usage of deliverables. Um, it ensures uh, there's uh, not ensures, but it helps clear the amount of misunderstanding that might uh, appear between team members, or also for, for instance, that if let's say your website should be um, have a module added by an external developer, you will have a have a or designer or, or theme or whatever, and you will have a, a better chance of of using what he he has in front of him. So, how could we use StyleGuys in a Drupal environment? Well, print has this very huge advantage. Um, print has a clearly defined visual canvas, and <laughs> it's an unfair advantage for some, um, at least me. Uh, and um, but you know, in Drupal we have something similar. Uh, something similar. Um, and the previous session again uh, mentioned this, um, and it's it's about the content framework that Drupal provides. This content framework is about the presentation of content, and as such, it provides a, a clear canvas um, for you to use. So, the typical workflow with a, with a style guide, um, it de it depends on the website. It depends on, on how large the website is. Um, as I mentioned, most of the website we we work on, at least in my experience, are fairly large websites and fairly complex web websites. So that's, uh, that justifies a certain amount of detail you put into this uh, style guide. Um, usually before I, I start theming, I, uh, I sit down with a, with, a, with a kickoff meeting with the external designer. And often this is external designer, but also we'll, if we're lucky enough that we, it's one of our in-house designers, or if, it mys if it's myself, they already know this stuff. But if it's an external designer, I find it highly valuable to, to just sit down and just uh, supply her, him or her with a list of common items, like typography lists, form elements, and so on. And when you're sitting in, when you're already sitting down with this designer, um, I suggest you also pinpoint common design elements like content boxes, panels, lists, and views together. Um, because basically, these are these are often common elements, and they appear on. on on a lot of different pages on the website, and as such, they could be they could benefit from being included in such a style guide. So specifically, what you should be including is, <laughs> yeah, typography. It's a uh, grid and baseline, and it's important that you get a proper grid and baseline defined, because you can use it for, for instance, JavaScript overlays, and it can help you uh, build the website in your browser and it helps ensure the, the correct usage of grids and, and so on. Also, lists, which in our case is views, most often. Um, also, form elements. And form elements, it, it can be a, a complex thing. We have uh, different uh, design patterns. We have uh, autocomplete and stuff like this. But it's all elements that we are more likely than, more likely than not to, uh, to, to, to come across when we theme our websites, at least at some po point in this uh, site's life cycle. So we might as well add them as well. But also there's button, use of color, color navigation and links. And here I'm also talking about tabs and stuff like that. Images and the usage of images. And taxonomy and teaser lists. It's also important that the webs, um, that the, uh, the designer define margins and white space, different states. I can't tell you how many times I've received a design from a designer. And there's a lot of links uh, on the page, and that's all, all very well. But we still need the, the, the hover states and the focus states and so on. And that goes for the form elements as well, of course. So that's a general thing. Um, here you see an example um, of a, a typography uh, page in a style guide. And this is from our own upcoming website, uh, Pites. Um I say upcoming because we've been working on it for some time, but we can't seem to find the right amount of time to finish it. <laughs> but, but it's coming, I promise. And as you see here, uh, the headlines are defined. We have defined a deck or a, a teaser field, and uh, specific submitted by and category tags, and general body, t uh, body styles. Also, another example, it's from the Great Belt website. Uh, basically, we build a website for a bridge. Uh, 
it, it's, it was actually more complex than you can imagine, <laughs> but uh, that's a different story. And here we uh, <laughs> we uh, we pinpointed a table. Tables are a common thing in Drupal as well, so we might as well pinpoint that and include them in the style guide. Also, paging, drop down, and different form elements. Also, messages, and you see the tabs and the field set. That's just some examples, but they are all uh, examples that could benefit from being included in such a style guide. Also, another clear benefit of this is that um, when when you make sure that you, all you have all these elements, uh, receive all these elements from the designer, you enable uh, yourself uh, to to build these sites in the browser uh, or as you go along, and you uh, you decrease the amount uh, or the need for specific page design from the designer. And and basically, we don't need. Uh, specific page design from the designer we don't want that because it constricts us and it <laughs> well at least from my point of view it makes my my job boring I hate doing that <laughs> um, but if we're supposed to be working like that 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 requires uh, a certain amount of inf information architecture or wireframes um, at Pites are cool um, we, we use information architecture we, we quite extensively actually um, a lot of the time we put into a side, we, we, we focus a lot on, uh, on the information architecture. And it's, an, it's a process. We have uh, one guy who, who mainly works on this and makes sure that it gets done. But it's a process that involves the entire team. And he's sitting there, by the way. He's, um, he helps ensure uh, that the entire team is, is being included and heard. And it's important. It's important that you make sure every team member is heard because they have each team member have a certain amount of knowledge and experience that it can bring to the to, to this information architecture or this wireframe, and it is important that we include this. I'm not going to be talking a lot about information architecture or wireframes because it's not my area of expertise, but uh, I want to just you know, briefly mention it because it's an important aspect of it as well. And it doesn't have to be overly complex. As you can see, this is an oversimplified example of, an <laughs> of a wireframe, um, but just so you get an idea of what I'm talking about here. If you make a simple wireframe and supply uh, it with a with a list of uh, output code, um, and with a list of output, I mean a list of the different fields in a page, um, you'll be setting yourself up uh, in a better way and make sure and ensure that you can put a lot of these pages t together in, in in the browser. So, yeah, okay, and I missed a slide here. If the project project warrants it, you should keep a list of intended output for each page. And again, if the if the site is fairly small, that might not justify this approach. But for the larger sites, I think this is a good idea um, because it provides a point of reference for the backend developer. So again, if he is ever in the position where he has to set up a view, a configure view, you'll have a, a central place where he can look up what this view is supposed to look like or the output, <coughs> and it makes those meetings a lot easier. <laughs> um, so, the benefit of all this is the replacement of page design in Photoshop with the design of content systems in Drupal. And I, when I, when this process, it doesn't necessarily have to take a lot, a lot of time, and it also clears up a lot of time with the designer because he doesn't have to redesign each page again in Photoshop. Um, um, but when all this is done, I tend to, uh, I move over to theming, uh, and I usually try and build a boilerplate, a standard theme for the, for the entire website. Um, and it, it seems like a no-brainer, but often I, I'm, I arrive in projects where the theme has already been partly built by the backend developer, and as such, it's very, um, it's very easy to just slide in there and start theming on top of this theme, or so, it, so it would look like. But in reality, you're setting yourself up for failure, because there's a lot of elements in this theme that you, do, you you don't know about it. there's simply a lot of outcomes that you, you couldn't have foreseen so disconnect yourself from that theme and make sure you theme a standard Drupal theme and by standard Drupal theme I mean Drupal out of the box it's a fairly simple thing and might seem like common sense but more often than not I come across sites where this hasn't been done and also it is a sort of it provides a sort of documentation you will always have as the theme as a point of reference for the future so remember, create a style guide, keep using and maintaining it, and make sure the site has a strong, well-defined information architecture. 
and help maintain it. <coughs> if you're providing a client with a theme for Drupal, you should make sure it works on even the most basic Drupal installation. Simple, I know, but... <coughs> also, also, sorry, when you when you use this standard theme or, or, or build this standard theme, it makes it easier for you to build on top of the modular nature nature of Drupal. Drupal is a modular architecture, and as such, it's easier to latch on top of it and, and exploit it. And as uh, by modular nature, I mean you know the modules. It's sort of like an object-oriented approach, but a lot of a lot of sites uh, builds uh, uh, specific mod modules for user stories, and these user stories are are basically you know, it could be a blog or or whatever, but it's still a specific use case. And as such, you could mi you, you might as well hide all your theme files and your template files uh, as uh, and etc. in this module, and it will have this uh, clear benefit that when someday down the line the, the client doesn't need this block module anymore they can just turn it off and the code disappears and as, as, as such you don't have to scour through the entire theme to find old uh, redundant code and that's a good thing it's a simple thing but still worth remembering so code structure again this is simple but I'm not going to, you know, uh, do a Marix sort tag and start making, you know, a, a theming nightmare. Uh, Marek had a, a nice session in at the design camp Berlin, where he <laughs> went over a, a site he had received from, I think, India or some other country, <laughs> uh, and basically, it, I think it had some something around 500 templates for fields and views and and whatnot, and they were all in the same. Uh, in the same folder, basic in, in basically in the theme folder, and yeah, th it's a bit of a nightmare, and it can't be avoided by by you know uh, simple things. Divide templates templates into folders like views, panels, notes, etc. <laughs> it's a simple thing, but it helps maintain the overview of the of the entire theme. And yes, code structure. Again, I touch about this bri briefly, but if, and I, I'd like to mention it again, but if you if you move a lot of your themes, CSS and, and styling, and new, use the new naming convention from Drupal 7, and by new naming conventions, uh, man conventions I mean something like system.base.css, if you use them and 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 put them in your in your module, you're going to be doing yourself a huge favor. Um, also, it makes it easier to override the CSS at another point in time, which is a good thing. Um, so, yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've ever felt the same way, but, but s sometimes... Um, <laughs> um, our job gets a bit... Uh, it gets like a routine. It feels like a job. And most of us does this because it's supposed to feel like a hobby. We love what we're doing, and we love coding. We like designing, and we like we like the we like theming. And uh, but about a year ago, um, I, I suddenly um, I felt tired about front end design. Uh, I felt tired of uh, cutting out images and putting them in my style sheets, and everything was just sort of repetitious. And uh, I did it over and over again, and it was just a routine. And I suddenly started feeling like a job. But then I attended the conference uh, called Future of Web Design in New York um, as a way of kickstarting myself. Um, and there I fell into talk with a lot of like minded individuals. And, and they made me realize that instead of being afraid to use things like CSS3 and HTML5, how many here uses CSS3 and HTML5 actively? That's a lot of you, actually. <laughs> Um, I didn't at the time. I was I was scared of using it. I was scared of what the client might might say or might react to it. Um, um, but so I went to New York, and I in New York I decided I should just go back and you start using it uh, on a client project. Um, and 
this is this is the thing. I, I had to use it on a on a client project without asking for permission, um, and it was a bit risky, I know, but su su such is life. And and we went on with it. So we started implementing HTML5 video, uh, border radius, and all these lovely new properties from CSS3. And 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 it was great. It, it was funny. It it gave us a new sense of flexible code, uh, and it, it was really it was really great. Uh, then uh, the meeting came with with the client, and and I dreaded this meeting with the client, but what happened? What had happened in the meantime was that uh, iOS, Android, and general mobile usage of their sites uh, th it had soared. Uh, we were talking about it was suddenly something about ten percent, and in the past they have always been quite. You know, They've, they've always been reluctant to go this path and, and start supporting all these new new properties. But this new reality they were facing, it required uh, some amount of use of CSS3 and HTML5. Um, at the, curr the current side couldn't, uh, it, they, at, with the current side, they couldn't play HTML5 video on an iPad, for instance. And we have just impl implemented HTML5 video, so we can just look at them and, and say, but we already did that. <laughs> so basically, we have already uh, optimized their site for, for these new platforms, and they were elated. They loved this. Um, and, and as such, because of this, the, the conversation never touched upon things like progressive enhancement and all of these techniques you can use to, to, to start using these new techniques. Um, the client just accepted it. It was just a fact of life. So I... I I recommend that you just jump into it. I know it, it's a bit of a risk. Just do it. Just start using it. Y your life will be better for it. There's some clear fen benefits of using CSS3 and HTML5. Spe specifically CSS3. It's fast. Um, it keeps the code flexible. And there's less need for cutting out graphics in Photoshop. Cutting out graphics is repetitious. Uh, we hate doing it. Uh, at least I do. Um, and it also makes makes the less uh, the site uh, less flexible. Also, it leaves more room for prototyping and an iterative approach. There's, there, it's not sensible to start prototyping and, and just build a page as a test or a small application in Drupal when you have to cut out or do the design first and cut out all the graphics and all that. When you can just start using it in the browser, maybe have a. a, a, a a small example of what it could look like, and you could start as a themer and start building it in the browser, and it keeps it more flexible. And it has has an, a, a more, it makes iterations more, more easy. So adaptation and, and ease of use. And um, there is some amount of hurdles, um, and there's a lot of new problems when you start using CSS3 and HTML5. One of these are vendor prefixes. Um, I don't. If you've started using CSS3, you have come across this problem. It's uh, the extensive use of window prefixes all over your style sheets, and f very easily your style sheets becomes ver very messy, and and generally they they become yeah it, it become it becomes hard to to gain a complete overview, and and that's where CSS preprocessors come in. Um, do any of you know CSS preprocessors? I know we've been touched upon it several times during the conference. So, okay, a few of you do. Um, I've mainly used less myself. Um, and, uh, and CSS preprocessors, they are mainly an extension to CSS. They uh, help provide CSS with new capabilities like variables, um, mix-ins, for instance, uh, functions, nesting, and so on. Um, this is an example of a variable in Lesk. Can you see this? Is this okay? Cool. Um, basically, you just define your variable and you start using it. Here's a, here's a color rule, and you define your use your variable, and it instantly inserts the color. It's very neat. But also, this is my favorite uh, mixins, which is uh, basically you know it's, it's like variables with classes. You define your class and your parameters so that you can pass by reference. And as such, you can start using it in your rules throughout the style sheets by, you know, either using the the class itself and adding that to 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 the rule, or the class itself with a new parameter. 
So for instance, if you added rounded corners, so that's 10 pixels, it will automatically uh, start using 10 pixels on all the corners. And you can also do this for border radios left and all that sort of thing. And it's very neat and, and it helps uh, avoid clutter and you can um, and you can define your, your rules once and you can start using them throughout your style sheets. There is a small caveat though, you have to include uh, these less style sheets at, on top of every style sheet in your Drupal theme. Um, but it's a small import rule and and it's, it's no big deal, really. Um, there's also nested rules, which I never use it uh, personally. Um, I think the main reason for it, or, or the main uh, uh, justification for its existence, is that it makes the, the CSS more easy, easily readable. But I love CSS. I love the way CSS looks, and, and, and I love to use CSS. So for me, it doesn't make that much sense. But maybe it does for you. I don't know. There's also functions. Um, again, I think this is a bit crazy. Uh, I haven't, I haven't personally had a real use case for it still, but some might have it. Uh, I don't know. I've actually, con I'm actually considering doing a fork on on less and removing all these uh, capabilities, just so an overseer's backend developer doesn't start using them in in their CSS files at s some point. It hasn't happened yet, but it's bound to at some time, at some point. Um, and uh, is there a model for this? Yes. Um, both SAS, SAS. Uh, I haven't really used SAS, but it, it's it's very similar to less in 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 the way it, you use it and how you use variables and and it has the same capabilities. It has uh, the advantage of being included in uh, this CSS framework called a, a Compass, and that's an advantage for some. But I don't use that, so it's it's irrelevant. Also, uh, Les has this neat little module, and it's a great little module. You just you turn it on and you add uh, the extension .les to all your CSS files, and then it just instantly compiles them and and, and it just works. And it works with uh, CSS aggregation as, uh, as well when you compromise your, your CSS files, which is a neat thing as well. Um, so yeah, final note: organizing your theme. And, and and your whole approach to this it goes a long way and um and really what it what it all comes comes down to is just common sense a lot of these these things but if if you make sure you're prepared and uh and build your theme the the proper way you're going to reach your goal faster. So, and also, the single most important thing that you can do is take upon yourself to communicate the constraints and possibilities of Drupal. Um, it can be to the backend developer, it can be to the designer, or, or whatever. But as such, instead of just bitching and moaning, as a wise guy once called it, you, you can take it upon yourself to communicate these uh, these constraints. And also, one of the main reasons a lot of deadlines tend to, tend to uh, when you don't meet deadlines, it's it can be for because of themers and, and developers who aren't involved in the project. And as such, I came across a, a great quote from the designer Andy Rutledge. He says, your designers should be running their own projects. Do not place some non-designer in between them and their client. You have a responsibility to shepherd your designers toward consummate professionalism. To do otherwise is to cripple their professional development, perhaps permanently. And I think this th this rings true for themers as well, for developers. Push them together uh, and let them know they have this responsibility to communicate the constraints and the possibilities of Drupal because the project manager just has, has, this, has this overview. So but also push them towards the client because it will help gain a, a s certain amount of responsibility and and it's my experience that you work that much harder if you know what's at stake. So, basically, that was it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it was a bit short. Um, I was. Uh, I've been told that the bus is leaving out uh, from out front, so you can go out there here at, at 
4 p.m. Uh, also, do you have any questions? Cool. I have one, sir. Constraints? Yeah. Well, it's fairly easy starting using HTML5. You can just change the doc type. But, yeah, but I mean yeah um, sort of constraints is actually easier than, than it sort of looked like because you, you can go all the way in and start using all the HTML5 elements and all the semantics, but it might not make sense for you. Um, and, and you can also just uh, implement HTML5 videos. And you can make it a, a, gradious, uh, a gradual thing uh, and, and just do it as you go along. Um, but just by, and I'm not kidding, just by changing the duct type, you change a lot of things. Um, so th there really were no constraints for us, at least. Um, there is the constraints about, you know, older browsers like i7 and i6 and, and images and specifically gradients. We, I love the use of CSS gradients, but, you know, it's not really widely adapted yet. Um, so if, if you have to uh, uh, cut out these images and you have to implement images, you can just do it in the end. So we just we just cut out all, the, all this uh, nonsense malarkey or whatever Brit <laughs> the British guy people call it mm -hmm. uh, uh, and stop focusing on it. And, and that action alone helped remove a lot of these constraints for us, at least. So, any, anyone else? One more time. So if you've got less pre processing, yeah. you're serving up a page, you've got less pre processing with CSS every time. Have you had performance problems with that, or is that caching? Yeah, it's cached. It's cached, yeah. And, uh, and no, uh, that's the great thing about it. It just works. And, and there is no drawbacks ab about it. Um, the only drawback about using less is that you have to include it on each of your CSS files. And when I first started using this, um, <laughs> I couldn't understand why it didn't work. I thought I could just, uh, you know, have this uh, CSS file and it would automatically be included in my info file and it would just work magically, but it didn't. So that's small constraint, a small include. Um, what? Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, yeah, it's about uh, the whole workflow. Uh, I define all my border radius and stuff like that. I didn't find them in a single file and add them in, a, for example, a less folder in my CSS folder. Um, and I in import them at the top of my CSS files where I'm supposed to be using border radius or the functions or whatever. So you just, you just define them at, uh, on the top and it just works. So, any other? Oh, okay. I did not know that. So, the 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 it's uh, he said it's worth noting that uh, less creates the file separately from. Yeah, it, it creates a less optimized file in a separate area from the other uh, uh, CSS files. And yes, I hadn't really realized that. So, but, but yeah, it, it's worth noting because it, it adds to the amount of CSS you have to download on each page. Um, it might also be worth considering using the less app instead of the module on Drupal, because then you can either locally and you're not going to end up with lots of problems. Uh, if you put something correct, less code in, it breaks your entire site. Yeah. Which is not good. So uh, it was not so much a, a question as a recommendation. It's uh, the lady. Uh <laughs> She recommends that we use the less app instead of using the module because if we add a, a, a wrong declara less declaration, it breaks the entire site, and that's true, really. Um, personally, for me, that that workflow didn't work for me, but uh, I know about the less app, and, and it's a great app. You can also use it from the command line, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, Yeah, uh, and that that's neat as well, and that might fit the developer types in here uh, uh, a bit better <laughs> than using an app. Uh, I'd prefer the app, but but yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? 
So, thank you. That's it. Also, a um, small little thing, I've been asked to give a little shout out to the Front End United uh, camp in Netherlands in 2012 from uh, Jesper, and he helps organize this thing. And if you want, you can get these neat little cards up here. Um, they're free, and you can take as much as you want and give them out, and, and so. So, thank you.